I'm glad to be here. I think uh, uh, it's pretty clear, I think, to all of us now that... that uh, no, I forgot to mention Loyal Rue is at uh, Luther College and is Professor of Theology and uh, History of Religion and is a two-time uh, two Templeton Award winner. So. It's actually philosophy and uh, religion, Sorry. yeah. Um, well, it, it's pretty clear, I think, to all of us that the issues uh, we're dealing with here are uh, complex. We've heard lots of different voices. Uh, and uh, the issues are also um, consequential. There's a lot at stake. And um, so I want to uh, help us try to get at, um, we've heard some about uh, the religious mind or religious mentality. Uh, and I'd like to help us uh, try to get uh, to one way of thinking about the nature of religion, because I think that's an important thing to sort out. Um, first, let me, let me just indicate that I think uh, it's possible to both generalize and naturalize religion. There is a, there's a view out there, sort of postmodernist notion, uh, that it's impossible to generalize across cultures, that every culture uh, is sui generis, that there is no commensurability between cultures, uh, and I think uh, that's probably wrong, uh, and I think we can, in fact, uh, seek out some cultural universals uh, and uh, come up with a general uh, theory of religion. There's another uh, widespread notion out there that uh, suggests that you cannot naturalize religion, um, and this is, um, I think, in part due to the influence of a uh, great historian of religion, Marcia Eliada, who said that religion is really about uh, the sacred, and since the sacred cannot be naturalized, uh, you cannot naturalize religion. Well, I don't think religion is about the sacred, actually. Uh, I think we can make a distinction between the goal of religion, the motives of religion, and the function of religion. Those are all teleological notions, but I think uh, the goal of religion is one thing. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, I, like everyone else, I, I assumed that religion was about God uh, and that the goal of religion was to come into some sort of relationship with God. And I think uh, for most devout people, that is what religion is about. That's the goal of religion. The more I looked at religion and religious behavior, the more I could see that beneath the goal of religion, uh, there were motives uh, at work in religion. Uh, and I saw that these motives were primarily therapeutic and political. So I got thinking religion may be uh, on the surface about God, but if you dig down a little bit, it's really about therapy and politics. That is, it's about personal wholeness, and it's about social uh, coherence. And so if those are the motives of religion, I, I looked at that very carefully, and I, the more I looked at these motives of religion, the more I saw a biological function, uh, which, which happens to be uh, reproduct, re reproductive fit and fitness. Now, I think that's pretty reductionistic, and if that's the case, then I can try to defend that later on. But anyway, uh, what I want to suggest, so we have those differences between um, um, the end or the, the goal, the motives, and the uh, function. I think we can understand religion if we can um, sort out the structure of a religious tradition. I think there is an underlying structure uh, behind uh, all religious traditions, uh, and I think we can sort out the functions uh, that religion performs, and I think we can say something about the origins. So if we understand the structure, the functions, and the origins of religion, uh, I think we have a, a good understanding uh, of what religion is. I can't say much about the origins today, but I think I'll try to say something about uh, the structure uh, and the function. Um, in my view, all religious traditions are narrative traditions. They have at the core, at the center, way down deep, uh, a myth, a story. And uh, it's not just any old kind of story. It's a special kind of story. Um, and uh, is that me fading away, or is that something else? <laughs> Uh, it's a story. The myth, the central story, really brings together and integrates two different kinds of ideas. 
Uh, every religious tradition has cosmological ideas, that is, ideas about how things are ultimately in the world. Uh, and every religious tradition has moral ideas, that is, um, ideas about which things matter ultimately for human fulfillment. Now, religious traditions bring these together <clears throat> in a centralized, integrated myth. That is to say, ideas about how things are are brought together and confused with ideas about which things matter. And I think this is what's um, unique about the religious mentality, that facts and values are confused. Uh, and this is important because uh, it provides the religious perspective with uh, a cosmos that is infused with value, and it also uh, provides us with values that have some sort of cosmic endorsement. Uh, if they have cosmic endorsement, then they will work in our minds uh, with the same kind of authority that facts uh, have in our minds. And so it's important for religious traditions to bring together ideas about how things are ultimately with ideas about which things matter ultimately. Now, obviously, that's a violation of the naturalistic fallacy. I think religious traditions systematically violate the naturalistic fallacy by confusing uh, facts and values. But I think, actually, the human brain also does that. I think the human brain is uh, a naturalistic fallacy violating system. I mean, think about it. Every good brain has to do two, three things. It has to sort of figure out what's going on in the world around and somehow encode information about the world around. A good brain also has to map what's going on in the world within. That's the sort of biological value system inside. Uh, and a good brain has to bring those two together so that it can invent some sort of adaptive behavior. And so all I'm suggesting here is that a myth, in, in a way, uh, does this sort of function on a sort of cultural level. It brings together uh, facts and values. Um, which suggests, then, that the central myth of a culture, and this is, this is I, I don't think we can overemphasize this, the central myth of a cultural tradition provides us with a single vocabulary, okay, a unified vocabulary that gives us an ultimate explanation for all facts. At the same time, it gives us an ultimate justification for all values a single vocabulary that justifies values and explains facts. Now, how does that happen? I think it happens. I mean, what can, what can bring these, link these two together? Um, I think uh, in, the, um, in religious traditions, what does that for us is metaphor. We have these metaphors that can somehow integrate facts and values. Um, now, the metaphor in the Abrahamic traditions, that is the dominant metaphor, is the metaphor of God as person, the personal God. This brings together uh, facts and values. Uh, it provides the ultimate explanation for facts, the ultimate justification for values, because, in fact, God is the creator of the world, creator of all reality, and God is also the author of the moral order. One God creates both the world of facts and the world of values. So that one God uh, functions then as the ultimate explanation for facts and the ultimate justification uh, for values. This is in the Abrahamic traditions. Other traditions have other metaphors uh, that work uh, to provide the same function. In uh, Indian traditions, the Dharma is that kind of uh, uh, metaphor. In Chinese tradition, the Tao. In ancient Greek tradition, the Logos. Uh, these are notions that integrate uh, fact and value. Uh, now, but that's not all there is to religion because there are strategies. Once uh, ideas are brought together into an integrated myth that brings together morality and cosmology, it's important for that story to get into the heads of everybody in the culture. 
we have to organize the stuff in here. And if, and, and if my sort of organization of my consciousness is similar to the organization of your consciousness, then we have the resources uh, for sharing a common culture. Okay, so it's important to get these uh, brains organized in a similar way so that we will see the world in a similar way, uh, we'll have a sort of intuitive understanding of uh, what problems are and so on. Uh, we won't, we'll uh, be on the same page, you might say. So it's important to get these ideas uh, into people's heads. And so religious traditions have developed all these strategies um, for refreshing the story, for maintaining the story, revitalizing the story. Uh, and these strategies uh, I've, I've indicated here, intellectual, institutional, ritual, experiential, aesthetic, uh, together they, um, they constitute a kind of full court press on the, con uh, on the consciousness, right? I mean, these strategies are constantly, it's like, Keeping a religious tradition together is like sweeping water into a pile. If you've never tried that, you should try it sometime. It takes a lot of work to keep a story uh, alive. And this is what these strategies do. Um, into, uh, religious traditions have intellectual strategies. That means they have philosophers or theologians or pundits uh, that, are, um, that are on hand uh, to clarify the myth uh, to interpret the myth, and also to defend the myth uh, against uh, criticism from the outside. There are institutional strategies. Somebody's got to decide when we're going to meet. Somebody's got to decide who gets to be a, a priest or a priestess. Uh, somebody has to uh, decide polity, internal polity, for, uh, for sorting out disagreements within the tradition, and so on. Uh, 